Hello and welcome to the Ethics Crash Course for the upcoming mains exam. The Crash Course is titled To Be or Not To Be. This is the first lecture of a series of six lectures which will be released back to back so that by the end of the month your entire ethics for the upcoming mains exam is completed. Now, Before we begin, I'd like to humbly request you to please go through two specific videos that I have already released. The first video is the approach video wherein I have restructured the entire syllabus in a manner that it is easier to study and it is more in sync with the kind of questions the UPSC has been asking as far as the ethics is concerned. Second is a video on answer writing which I had released as a part of the water strategy series because we're going to be using some of the structures that were discussed in that answer writing video to continue and proceed with the rest of our lectures. Now, uh, as far as the first lecture is concerned, we are going to be covering specifically the following parts of the syllabus. We're going to be covering essence, determinants and consequences of ethics in human action, laws, rules, regulations and conscience as a source of ethical guidance. Now there is a reason that I have clubbed both of these topics together. The official text of the UPSC syllabus identifies the first topic to be a part of the moral philosophy portion of ethics whereas the second topic is in the context of administrative ethics or governance ethics as far as the official syllabus is concerned. This means it would be our understanding that UPSC is going to ask philosophical open-ended questions from the first topic and more administrative sort of questions in the second topic. But that is not the case. When we look at the previous year questions, we understand there have been questions that have been asked from a philosophical standpoint comparing ethics, values, law, conscience from a more personal point of view, which is why they have to be studied together. They have to be covered in a systematic fashion. Now to understand this better, I have restructured this by covering four basic key terms, conscience, morality, values and ethics. We'll do a broad overview of these terms and what are the determinants of these terms as far as moral philosophy is concerned, which basically means what makes us moral, what makes us ethical, what makes us um, legally compliant and so on and so forth. And there is actually a more systematic way to do this. If we simply go through the previous year questions, this is a practice that you must apply while you study all general studies questions, no matter what they may be, no matter what subject they may be a part of. So let's look at the previous year questions from 2013 onwards, because 2013 is where the pattern was changed and GS paper four was introduced. Now, before we begin with GS paper four, there are essentially two very important points of information that have to be shared with you. One, let us not forget that we are here to get the highest possible marks. So one should not get carried away while getting into the nitty gritties and the intrinsic concepts behind ethics. And two, Ethics must always be studied from an arm's distance, which means it is a lot like a general surgeon being trained to not be affected by the misery of the patient because that would impair the ability of the general surgeon to perform the operation on the patient successfully. So as students of moral philosophy, as students of ethics, you must look at it in the most objective form because the only way you can combat subjectivity is through objectivity. Let's look at the previous year questions. We'll start 
from a chronological fashion and we'll see have the nature of questions evolved as far as the UPSC is concerned. Now in the year 2013, there was a question that said, what is meant by crisis of conscience? Narrate one incident in your life where you were faced with such a crisis and how you resolved the same. Now, when we see the word conscience, we usually find it in the context of governance ethics, where conscience is a source of ethical guidance and it is mentioned in, in the continuation of laws, rules and regulations. But as we were mentioning earlier, the UPSC has asked a very personal question on conscience, right? When have you been conflicted and what was the situation like that in your life and how did you resolve it? Now, you don't have to worry about the technicalities or the definition of conscience. What you must understand is it's nothing but an innate ability to judge between what is right and what is wrong or what is more right or what is less wrong, right? And then you can apply it to a personal incident, identify a conflict and then explain what sort of decision did you take, what course of action did you take. It would always be advisable that the personal incident or the personal narration that you are giving should not contain personal details about yourself because those are prohibited. That's a very important element while writing the ethics paper. Even if the UPSC is asking you to narrate a personal incident, that personal incident should not contain personal information about yourself. So you should not write your name, you should not write the place of the country that you come from, certain biographic or demographic details. Because the standard instructions released by the UPSC prohibit you from doing so. So this has to be written carefully. But what does this 2013 question tell you? The 2013 question tells you that there was just a word, you were asked a related word, a meaning of it and the application of it. Right? Then you have another question in 2013 which says what do you understand by the term voice of conscience? How do you prepare yourself to heed to the voice of conscience? Now conscience is of course uh, through moral philosophy understood by many thinkers to be the voice of God and also for those of you who do believe in the existence of God that would also be the case. But voice of con conscience is also similarly a very innate understanding, a very innate moral compass that every individual idealistically possesses. And how do you prepare yourself is, how do you make sure that you will always listen to it and does it necessarily always have to be right? Again, you had a question wherein a term was asked, a related term to the core term in the syllabus was asked and therefore you were asked um, a subsidiary question around it. Okay, So therefore, having one pages on each of the terms that are mentioned in the syllabus and associated terms and their application is a good way to study moral philosophy. Then in 2014, there was a question which was, what do you understand by values and ethics? In what way is it important to be ethical along with being professionally competent? Right? Now, uh, this of course means you need to know the meanings of the keywords ethics and values. How are they different between the two? What are the repercussions as to uh, what happens if you're not ethical or if you don't fa follow values? Why do people tend to be ethical or why do people tend to be driven by values? And is, is there a conflicting nature between the two? For example, if your ethics is to ensure that you don't want to sell a product to a consumer who doesn't need it, but your value is that you have to be driven in terms of performances. So for example, let us say in the education technology industry, where a lot of the people who work in the sales department of edtech companies may often be conflicted with this, right? The value of the organization is that you're driven and you have to achieve your targets and you have to be hardworking and ambitious. But ethically, do you think you should force a parent 
to buy a course for the child that may not be in the best interest of the child or that may not necessarily be needed by the child. So that's a conflict between being ethical and being professionally competent, right? Then in 2015, a simple question explaining you or asking you the difference between law and ethics, ethical management and management of ethics, discrimination and preferential treatment, personal ethics and professional ethics. Now personal ethics and professional ethics are the dimensions of ethics, the applications of ethics, but I've still included it because it also has some basic terminological differences. Law and ethics, what is the difference? Ethical management and management of ethics, what is the difference? Uh, and of course, discrimination and preferential treatment. Now, uh, we'll of course get into this. Uh, to give you a basic, uh, a basic understanding, ethical management is how are you managing an organization or any unit in an ethical manner. And management of ethics is through what means are you managing that organization or a unit. What are the kind of guidelines that you have put into place? Next, in 2017 is where <clears throat> questions become far more thought provoking in nature. Questions become far more subjective in nature and therefore becomes easier for students to write better answers. So 2017, the question is the crisis of ethical values in modern times is traced to a narrow perception of the good life. Now, if you remember the answer writing video, we had discussed the variable method, wherein most UPSC questions will always have the impact of X on Y. Sometimes you may have three variables and you can accordingly divide the question into the permutations and combinations between those variables. So, the crisis of ethical values is what is being impacted is traced to a narrow perception of the good life. So the narrow perception of the good life is having an impact on the crisis of ethical values. You could subdivide this question into why does narrow perception have an impact? What is the impact and what should the impact be? And therefore, you should be able to write about 150 words with adequate examples. This is a simple subdivision method. Then in 2018, again, there is a theoretical question. Distinguish between the code of ethics and a code of conduct with suitable examples. So for instance, this again is you've taken a variable, you've taken a term, asked a term related to the term and therefore ask the question on the differentiation behind it. See, the word code of ethics or code of conduct per se is not mentioned. But if you study ethics, you study applications of ethics, you study forms of ethics, this is one of the forms of ethics, which is why there was a question that was asked here. Now, in 2019, when the Supreme Court had used the term constitutional morality in several of its judgments, later on in the Mains paper, also in GS paper 2, this was also asked, but in a more legal context. The question is, what is meant by the term constitutional morality and how does one uphold constitutional morality? Now, how does one uphold? Everybody would know what is constitutional morality. I'll briefly discuss this. The chances of it being asked again are negligible. But how does one uphold constitutional morality is an answer that you'll have to write across multiple levels. That one of the best ways to do this. Now, constitutional morality is morality which is existing as an outcome of the constitution or having a sense of moral judgment on something on which the constitution is silent. Now the constitution impacts who all? It impacts the legislature, it impacts the executive, it impacts the judiciary, and it of course impacts the citizens. So how can each of these four components, stakeholders of the constitution, imbibe constitutional morality? This, is, this could be solved through a simple stakeholder analysis method. Now in 2020, they gave you a quote with respect to a basic uh, ethical value. Hatred is destructive of a person's wisdom and conscience and that can poison a nation's spirit. You can see the two variables. That 
hatred is having an impact on a person's wisdom and conscience and that can imp can can severely impair a nation's spirit so why does it impact how does it impact how should we prevent it from getting impacted of course in the larger context of hate speech and other forms of hatred that exist in society then in 2021 a more uh, contemporarily relevant question which was impact of digital technology as a reliable source of input for rational decision making is a debatable issue again a simple variable method how is the digital technology having an impact on rational decision making with of course a suitable example now this could be also done in the context of technological ethics or data ethics but this also is about how technology helps you think of ethical decisions so these are the kind of questions that have been asked now what do we understand what is it that we should be preparing as far as these questions are concerned number 1 we should be looking at terms and associated terms terms and associated terms so if for example it is conscience what are the different words that are associated with conscience conscience crisis of conscience degree of conscience conflict of conscience and examples and applications of those similarly morality similarly values similarly ethics similarly law right and a interrelationship between them apart from that you just have to prepare what are called your impact variables how is x impacting a particular ethical dimension this will make sure that this part is prepared now comes the important part <clears throat> when you are writing answers for theoretical questions in ethics now this is very important please listen to this as carefully as you can as you can see a total of 10 marks are allotted for almost all theoretical questions that come in the first section of the ethics paper and all of them carry about 150 marks now what are the common mistakes that students make when they are attempting these questions what is it that you shouldn't do then whatever is left is what you can do that's a simple way of eliminating the wrong so what you have is essentially the right first students often paraphrase the question and explain the question in their own words to the examiner you don't do that you should never do that if the question here is impact of digital technology as a reliable source of input for rational decision making is a debatable issue then don't write in a data driven world where most of the decisions that we as people as a society as industry and as a, as the world take are driven by a set of statistical technologically compliant methods what you've basically done is you have rewritten the question in a completely different manner the examiner knows what the question is don't explain the question to the examiner that's the first point where students often go wrong the second is students often for the sake of of being uh, repetitive for the sake of being uh, slightly uh, verbose tend to say the same thing in different ways because we often run out of content don't do that for example in this question itself um, the impact of of digital technology is a reliable source that digital technology comes from a very very small uh, focus group in society to make your decision based on say a thousand people who have access to technology at a national level may not make a lot of logistical and a lot of rational sense you said this now don't say digital divide two paragraphs later that is something that you must sincerely avoid being repetitive 
third is being verbose third is using language to complicate what you're essentially trying to say that the juxtaposition of technology and societal development has put us at a junction of grave ethical dilemma we understand that don't unnecessarily try to gain points by writing stuff which is poetic or extrapolatory in nature so how do you answer theoretical questions in ethics 70 percent of your answer should be applications real life examples multi-layered examples you've done the stakeholders for ethics in answer writing a personal example a family example a society example a community example an industry example an ngo example a government example and an international example you have about six seven sort of examples to choose from see whichever fits the question the best is going to be the most appropriate answer to it so so that's one second is uh, while 70 percent of your answer has to be purely application and example driven 30 percent could be philosophical in nature wherein you can quote a thinker or you can quote a, a very philosophical understanding of the term which we will anyways cover in terms of contributions of moral philosophers and thinkers in the next day or so itself in, in by today itself so that you have everything in one place so that is how your answers have to be written now very important <clears throat> If the ethics questions ask you for an opinion, right? Do you think this has happened? Do you think there is a problem? Always remember, in the introduction itself, just right there inform the examiner that yes, you think this has happened. Yes, you think this is your opinion for a broad set of reasons. You can just summarize what you're going to write in the introduction itself this is very very important if the question has specifically asked for your opinion then in the first para itself in the introduction itself give your opinion and then let the rest of the body substantiate your opinion that is always a very smart and very effective way to go about it don't wait for the answer to be over and say this is what my opinion is what you're essentially doing is playing with the patience of the examiner which is not necessarily needed okay so these are your past year questions this is what we've understood these are the only kind of questions that are going to be asked fair enough now let us move to studying our topics very very carefully we're going to start with a broad comparison pick up each of the terms and then do a detailed analysis with referencing some of the relative terms okay so let's begin the first and the most important part is are you using flowcharts or diagrams now first things first if you are and it is relevant to the question you can do that in a 10 marker unless it is absolutely necessary don't use a flowchart in a 12 and a half marker it makes sense but in a 10 marker don't unnecessarily use a flowchart what is also very important is if you've driven a hierarchy or a hub spoke or a flowchart don't spend time explaining that flowchart the whole point of a flowchart is that it is self-explanatory so if you've if you've given if the question is trace the hierarchy of of morality and law and you've given a small little diagram like this don't explain the diagram get into things beyond the diagram get into details of specifics of these values and that's something that you must understand as a ground rule across your gs papers whenever you're using flowcharts hub spokes anything you will never explain the flowchart the flowchart has to be self-explanatory for instance, in a completely unrelated example, if you have drawn a hierarchy kind of a flowchart where you've explained the institutional structure to enforce the right to information, don't explain the hierarchy. We can understand from the hierarchy 
we can understand from your diagram that you've understood the hierarchy that the central information commission and the state information commission are parallel organizations they are not necessarily subordinate to each other so that is something that we understand from the flowchart you don't have to necessarily explain it so that's an example now let's begin with plotting the 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 values as a whole right of course the journey starts with conscience and ends with law what is even a more basic unit of conscience and often people get confused though it is not in your syllabus per se but we must understand it is called consciousness right is called consciousness now you must understand consciousness and conscience are two very different things they are interrelated they have an impact on the final decisions that that people make but consciousness has a neurobiological element to it to explain this to you in a very simple uh, format many years ago there was an experiment that was taken and it, it was conducted on a person who had something called hemispheral neglect now hemispheral neglect means one part of the hemisphere of the person's brain was not functioning right and an image was placed in front of the person an image of a house then followed by another image of a house on fire so basically there was a person now this person has two sides to the brain the left side and the right side and there were two images that were placed before the person one image was on a house with on fire and the second was on a house which was not on fire now despite the fact that one half of the person's brain was not functioning the person repeatedly chose the house without fire this means there was some processing that the person's brain was doing without the person understanding that the brain was processing information this is called consciousness that you do not realize that your brain is actually processing information at a speed at a pace but you may not understand the processing of it right so consciousness is nothing but uh, a form of information processing by the brain conscience on the other hand is a default setting across all of humanity to primarily be good do good and always believe in the good so only when consciousness and conscience combine are people inherently good people right if you are not able to process you will not be able to make a decision right so that is why the journey begins with consciousness but actually uh, your from a moral philosophical point of view it is actually conscience that is the building block of it so conscience is your inner self your most inner innate ability of understanding whether something is right or wrong so for example you don't have to necessarily be taught in a school that killing somebody is wrong right it when somebody tries to kill somebody that must raise a conscience alarm of some kind that is what is called conscience these are basic values of what is right and what is wrong without any intervention per se right it is very innate it is the purest form of human belief right now of course belief is a heavy word there are different understandings of the word belief there are core beliefs there are peripheral beliefs but you don't have to do them because they're not directly related to any of the terms which are mentioned in your syllabus so you don't have to worry about studying about belief per se now so this is what is called conscience now different upbringing society family values peer groups etc etc social conditioning experiences of life difficulties that a person faces in life then starts 
in the in the participation of a process which is called determination of morality and morality as we would understand is subjective it could be okay in one society to do x it may not be okay in another society to do the same x it may be okay for a person to believe in x in one way it may not be okay for another person to believe in x in a different context so for example if somebody is hasn't eaten food for 5 days and a person sees a loaf of bread kept at a grocery store out in the open and if the person then goes and steals that loaf of bread that person's morality is defined by his or her social circumstances so that is what is called morality morality is your final individual moral stand so what is the difference between conscience and morality conscience is without any adulteration of any external factors morality is when external factors then shape one specific person's moral values so that is why conscience is inner self and morality is an individual i'll give you enough examples when we do these terms in detail then comes your values now let's understand this there is a person a who believes in x and y is something that the person wants to believe in this is aspirational in nature this is what you have to abide by and these are called values values are usually some things that you must achieve you must try and live by these are some principles that that guide you to be a certain way work in a certain manner um, take actions in a certain capacity and so on and so forth on the other hand ethics is again something which is far more open ended is far more collective so values are what you should aspire to things that make you and everybody else around you more prosperous and better in their current state of affairs ethics is your averages of morality the if you apply the law of morality morality to individuals what you get is ethics for example in a conservative society if there are 100 people who live in a conservative society and 10 people believe it is okay to have a live in relationship but 90 people don't then the ethics of that society is live in relationships are wrong so this is nothing but a collective term and this can get enforced in two manners code of ethics and code of conduct now code of ethics is not enforceable in nature it is a lot like the preamble this is a guiding light but code of eth code of conduct is more like fundamental rights it is enforceable in nature you ha you have to abide by the code of conduct it has some form of institutional recognition and the highest form of institutional recognition is law which tells you what is right what is wrong it may not necessarily be based on on averages but it of course is a guiding light of choosing between right and wrong right and of course there would be international laws there would be national laws and so on and so forth so this is the broad hierarchy of the kind of terms that exist and now we will get into the interpretations the meanings of these terms now as far as the syllabus is concerned this will have this will have multiple terms degree of conscience uh, conscience um, it will also have conflict of conscience morality will have associated terms so religious morality um, constitutional morality it will not have different types of morality like how you have conflict of conscience you have crisis of conscience you have degree of conscience here you will have say constitutional morality religious morality values will always be at a at a level of operation so societal values industrial values or corporate values national values religious values and so on and so forth ethics would always be based on 
applications of it. So, for example, uh, how do we understand uh, administrative ethics, industrial ethics, bioethics, international ethics, security ethics, technology ethics, so those personal ethics, professional ethics. This is based on application related terms, right? These are self-explanatory and this is of course fairly confined in its own right. So these are largely the kind of um, uh, the kind of terms that exist in a larger hierarchy, so to speak. Now let's quickly compare all of them and understand because we're only going to be getting 150 marks on it. So a broad definition and a basic difference in terms of an example is more than enough. So let's quickly understand a broad understanding of the same. So first, morality, ethics, values and law. What is the difference? Morality is nothing but principles or habits with respect to right or wrong conduct while morals also prescribe do's and don'ts morality is ultimately a personal compass of what is right and what is wrong so what does this definition mean it means morality is nothing but a sense of a, a, a certain set of principles which guide you towards telling you what is right and what is wrong for example if if animal rights deeply impact you then to that extent uh, being a non-vegetarian is a moral conflict right that's a moral conflict that i would personally be affected by similarly what is ethics the difference is ethics are the rules of conduct recognized in a particular class of human actions or a particular group or a culture so while this is individualistic this is a far more collective phenomena and values are principal standards or qualities considered to be worthwhile or desirable so this is something which is more aspirational and what is law i'm sure all of you would know this law is nothing but a set of rules and regulations enforced by the authority to control human behaviors for the common good let's take a simple example right let's take an example of say dowry because it will apply to all of those dowry is essentially putting a transactional value to marriage what is how would this apply to everything else you may have uh, say for example you are an individual who would have studied at a, at a very good school and a very good college with a cosmopolitan urban mindset and therefore it would be your personal moral compass that you would individually believe that dowry is wrong one should not indulge in it right now let us say you come from a very very orthodox and a very very conventional background despite that you've studied in an urban area you despite that you've had very very exposed education your background is that 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 supports dowry in a form of cultural practice so as a society you may find your community or your society being okay with the element of dowry what is it that you would aspire to you would aspire to equality of expenses during a marriage right so this is a value that you aspire to that if two people are getting married they should have an equal amount of expenditure that they would have made for the marriage to be equal now the law may not particularly care what your community might think the law would want to upgrade the thinking of your community by saying that boss at the end of the day there are enough number of crimes and violations and and, uh, and violence that happen because of dowry in the country and the law of averages is that more people are harassed because of dowry than more people who are not so therefore we will make a law which criminalizes dowry so this is how the same example would therefore be applicable 
on four completely different parameters. This is what is called morality, ethics, values and the law. Okay. Now that we've understood this, let us move to the next part where we'll take up the more the, the, the basis of all of this conscience. Now we'll have to write a few quotes. I've given you a choice of these three quotes. Pick whichever one you like. I will anyways uh, link the database for quotes which you can use in your answers also. I'll maintain the database on my website. Quotes, examples, committee recommendations, judgments, data sets. You just have to revise them. They have multiple applications. You, will don't have to, you won't have to do anything else. So let's start with the first. Albert Einstein said, never do anything against conscience even if the state demands it. Now, where would you use this quote? You will use, you will use this quote in any question which gives you an element of government and morality in it. Can sometimes government take some actions which may or may not be moral. So any question which has government and morality or government and what is right and wrong, you can mention this quote by Albert Einstein. Then Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What does he say? There comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor political nor popular but he must take it because conscience tells him that it is right. That doesn't matter if it is helping people, it may be furthering your cause, it may have an advantage to your growth, it doesn't matter. Sometimes you have to do things just because they are the right things to do. They may come at a personal cost and that is okay. So where would you use this? You would use this in a question where there is a conflict of morality and growth, a conflict of morality and prosperity. Like for example, let us say in a market economy, does it make sense to have some social benefits that have to be given to the people? Now in a market economy, uh, where everything is run on principles of open competition and, 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 and free uh, extraction of resources, only those who survive in that market should be rewarded with the prosperity. But that does not mean the poorest of the poor should be left out of the fray. That does not mean that we take care of people. We don't take care of people who don't have the means to fight it out in the open market. So this is where a quote like this could be used. Third, of course, is by none other than Mahatma Gandhi. He said, there is a higher court than courts of justice and that is the courts of conscience. It supersedes all other courts. Now, this is where you could, you could use this in a question on law versus right and wrong, law versus morality and so on and so forth. You could also use these quotes in an essay and a lot of uh, social issues, a lot of vulnerable section questions also. These quotes can be recycled. Also, I'll give you a small little trick. The UPSC has been asking ethics questions since 2013 and there have been at least three to four quotes in every ethics paper. Just reuse these quotes because these are actually very good quotes that the UPSC has made questions on, right? I'll teach you how to solve quote related questions when we come to thinkers and philosophers. But right now, this is more than enough. Now, that we've understood this, we now move into the applications of conscience, the meaning and the interpretations of it. So conscience, what is its meaning? What is the context and how do we apply it? The meaning of conscience is fairly clear. It is the inherent ability of every individual, of every healthy human being to perceive what is right and wrong and on the strength of this perception to control, monitor, evaluate and execute their actions. Now, of course, this sounds a lot like morality. It is. But if the word says conscience, you just put conscience there. Don't worry too much of the differences between conscience and morality because both of these are layers of an individual ability. But this definition does contain some very important terms. It is number one, the inherent ability of every healthy human being, which means one, everybody's default setting 
is to be good and second for the default setting everybody should also be in a good space so for example a child has suffered from some form of childhood trauma right because and let us say the child has seen a lot of childhood trauma of the child's father mercilessly beating the mother and therefore the child is enraged and has a lot of anger in terms of the domestic setting of the house and the child then develops very very strong hatred for the institutions in place and therefore acts in a certain manner the child is not necessarily a very healthy person because you've had a childhood trauma so a healthy human being does not necessarily just mean mental health it also means any form of physical health as well so for example let us say somebody who has been um, who has met with an accident let us say so let let me give you a simple example and this is a difficult example but it's a good example let us say somebody for no fault of their own uh, is hurt very poorly and very badly in a bomb blast which happened because of communal riots and by a radical organization for no fault of their own person now in a scenario like that if the person has a very very difficult and a very very uh, uh, non neutral way to look at religion and secularism it's because the fundamental premise of being a healthy human being has been violated that's why it's very important to be healthy to perceive what is right and wrong which is also an ingredient of you should also be able to understand and process that what you are doing or what you intend to do or you're able to you're able to process the fact that there is something right or there's something wrong going on a lot of people are not able to do that and on the strength of this perception which is that if for example in front of you there is a um, a person who's being harassed on the street uh, let us say a poor vegetable vendor is being harassed by a local goon you must find that to be offensive and if you find that to be offensive is when you will do whatever you can to report that action or to stop and help the person for example let us say you are driving on a highway and you find an accident has happened and one of the victims of the accident is lying on the road and requires immediate medical help but it is at 2 o'clock in the night and the highway is completely stranded and alone and empty unless you understand that it is inherently wrong to not help a person in need you will not stop the car risk say any sorts of legal consequences and wait for the ambulance to arrive so that the person's life could be saved so this is what is meant by conscience okay now let's understand the the context of this just to give you the second paragraph to your answer on conscience values as right or wrong good or evil just or unjust fair or unfair have always existed throughout human history but they're also shaped by an individual's cultural political and economic environment the context is that this inherent ability to perceive what is right and what is wrong is never pure it is never unadulterated it is always affected and deeply examined by certain actions that happen in and around the person there will always be a cultural a political and an economic environment for example let us say culture what your view on dowry would be would depend on how women are placed and treated in the society or the general community that you may come from from a political point of view for example till the early 1900s almost a lot of countries in the west had not given women equal voting rights now this is in the context of course of the recent overturning of the us supreme court um, judgment on an abortion 
and the context is when abortion is about women rights that we must also talk about the most primary right that women have is to be equal partners in voting in the democratic process so depending on the the circumstances that you've had if women are not actively working if women are not actively contributing to the country as a whole the country or the leadership may not consider them important enough to be participating in the democratic process which is why till the early 1900s several countries especially the us in 1900 did not have rights given to women to vote similarly economic for example we are hearing of massive layoffs that are happening across multiple high valued startups across different sectors in the country now these startups are in a funding crunch and therefore they have to demonstrate profitability and profitability can be demonstrated in two ways one you have to spend less and two you have to earn more so for earning more they will of course uh, increase their promotions and their marketing efforts but at the same time to spend less they will get rid of people who they don't need they will ask people to leave those companies right now this is of course a conflict of conscience that you've been suddenly fired from your job for no reason of yours it's just because the company did not have the resources or did not think of you to be important enough and that of course is a conflict of conscience the second uh, context to conscience is the closer our inner state of conscience identifies the higher perception of these values such as good right just and fair the higher will be our degree of conscience and less physical stress is experienced if we feel that we act according to these concepts so the idea here is for you to have a moral compass you must fundamentally believe that good doing good or being good is good being fair is good being justified is good if you don't then of course it's going to be far more difficult for anybody to actually have that kind of a moral compass for example when celebrities look at endorsing tobacco or tobacco related products they often don't understand is that by being public figures if they're endorsing something which is fundamentally detrimental to the health of the people and whatever they say is going to have a massive impact on the people and by endorsing a tobacco product you are subtly enforcing that it is okay to consume it there is a heightened sense of 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 presence and and it is a cool thing to do and it is it is a it is a sign of prosperity and all of those things because if you see because if you see a lot of these tobacco consumption ads most of these are honestly surrogate in nature so they don't really mention that they that that this is the tobacco product they will they will uh, you know place a demo or, or or a dummy product which does not have tobacco or for example mineral water or music cds and so on and so forth but everybody understands what is it really about and if a celebrity is doing something it means there must be a certain degree of of it being okay now the reason that would happen is because a celebrity would not understand that it is unfair for the celebrity to use his or her public stature to get him or her that multi crore advertising contract and use that multi crore ad advertising contract to sell something which is fundamentally against the health and well being of the people so this is what is your basic understanding of context of conscience what is it and what is the context to conscience one of course is that it is shaped by certain factors and two is of course how closely do you identify with the basic premise of being right or wrong now that we understand this we move to the impact of conscience right what is the basic impact why wh what happens to conscience first one who acts with a clear conscience has the advantage of feeling what is called inner peace 
it is a feeling that mitigates the adverse psychological effects which are ex experienced in the times of stress. A simple example would be that let us say you are traveling to some place in an aircraft and certain items are prohibited on an aircraft. For example, let us say you're going from home to college, right? Now, your mother or your father or anybody at home has packed you a lovely jar of home, pick, home, home uh, cooked pickle. Now, that, that pickle is in a semi-liquid state. You cannot carry that because that amount of pickle is not permitted on the flight. And you did not check in, check in that luggage because um, you are already overflowing with luggage. Now, you wrap that pickle in a paper in such a way that it doesn't look like pick, pickle, right? And you're passing through security. You will always be under the constant stress that if the security, the CISF at the airport catches you, then of course you're going to be embarrassed. If that pickle opens up or overflows in the cabin, in the aircraft, it might cause a lot of discomfort and unpleasantness to the passengers around you. So the basic idea here is that when you don't have a clear conscience, when you are always doing things which, are, which you know are wrong, you will always have a degree of stress, something poking you and not letting you be peaceful and calm. Second, if one acts against one's own conscience, it can lead to a, to a feeling of having a troubled conscience. In this condition, a process begins that creates an inner irritation or an inner itch that does not allow a moment of peace. Eventually, anxieties and phobias manifest and they are the symptoms of a harassed health state. What does this mean? This means when you know that something is wrong and you're acting against that, 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 that idea that you know is wrong, you've executed an action which you know is wrong, something from inside is telling you it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. In such a scenario, over a period of time, you will become irritable, you will become short-tempered, you will become um, slightly itchy, you will become slightly difficult, right? And therefore, it will also have an impact on your overall, overall health state. I'll give you a simple example. Let us say, there is a witness in a criminal trial who has been bribed by one of the parties in a criminal trial to give their statement in a particular way. Which means the statement that has been given by the witness is a doctored statement and it could fundamentally compromise the criminal trial and an innocent person may be jailed or a guilty person may not be jailed. And you know that, for example, that person has tampered a report or has tampered the sequence of events or has, has tampered the, 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 the motive or has said something which jeopardizes the trial and you are a key witness to it. You will always, always, always have that itch eating you from inside, right? For example, let us say as civil servants, you often have to uh, submit data of the performance of government schemes in your district to your higher authorities. And on the basis of that data, the higher authorities will decide further policy decisions and financial allocations to that scheme. Now, let us say you have manipulated that data to show that the scheme is doing very well and you've been able to reach out to the beneficiaries. But deep down, you know that the beneficiaries have not been helped. The state of affairs in your district is not up to the mark. It may eat you from inside. Similarly, for example, if somebody decides to gamble money, which is, uh, let's say, let's say that, that there is a couple and they had saved some money for buying a house. Now, one of the partners in the couple decides to go and gamble. Notwithstanding the fact that gambling institutionally is anyways illegal in India, but let us say one of the partners in the couple takes up that those funds that they have saved up for a house 
and had collectively saved up funds for that house and they decide to gamble with the money. Now they lose that money and the other person does not know about it. In such a scenario, that will cause a person to constantly be irritable, will constantly, you know, snap back or will constantly be in a very agitated mental state. And as a result, consequently, conscience therefore ranks higher than consciousness. Because consciousness, if you remember we discussed, is the processing of information. Conscience is judging that information as to whether it is right or wrong. And in addition to that, has the ability and the authority to decide how information will be used either for good or for evil. For example, let us say the government is in the possession of powers to conduct surveillance or a tracking exercise on a large chunk of its citizens, right? Now the question is, does the government use this for political gains, for personal gains, for example, as it has been alleged in a recent controversy where an Israeli uh, software was allegedly being used and the case is currently sub judice and therefore it will be inappropriate to comment on whether this actually happened or not. But there is a case, there is an issue. The proceeds of the case are still in, in progress. So how does the government use its powers of surveillance, its abilities and infrastructure of surveillance? Similarly, when big tech companies sell the meta metadata of its consumers to advertising companies, does that fundamentally compromise the privacy of its users? What you do with that information is of course an element of consciousness. However, now always remember in ethics, always in ethics and in essay, always argue the opposite. If X is true, write about X, then you must also give a counter view because that's what ethics is. There are multiple ways to looking at it. However, constant conscience is usually influenced and modified in its decisions by the natural instincts of survival and perpetuation. We as human beings are no doubt social beings, but self-preservation is a very, very fundamental human trait that you will do everything within the powers of yourself to make sure nothing happens to you. Then only will you take care of the world and the society and everything else. So for example, let us say in your context as civil servants, you will make sure that if you have to take an inquiry, your inquiry is and you are supposed to head an inquiry you will only uh, participate in a flawlessly transparent inquiry if you know that the inquiry that you conduct is not going to have an impact on your career as a civil servant because self-preservation. Similarly, in an individual manner, self-defense. It's absolutely wrong to kill somebody. One should never kill somebody. You understand that. But if somebody is charging against you, towards you with a knife, and you can see a metal rod next to you and you pick up that metal rod and smash somebody's head. You've done that in the absolute need of self-preservation. Then morality and conscience can often take a hike. Similarly, deforestation. That if urban areas are, are incapable to house the ever increasing urban population, then nearby areas have to be shaved off, have to be cut off and infrastructure has to be built because current urban cities do not have the infrastructural capacity to host the growing needs of urban population. Are you breaking the balance of, of nature? Yes. Are you affecting the ecological habitat of various flora and fauna around you? Yes. But if you don't do this, then the existing urban cities do not have the capacity and therefore will crumble from their original state. So deforestation. Similarly, only if you are in power will you be able to make policies that are going to affect the country. And for that, you'll have to do everything within your power to come to power. 
So if vote bank politics and communal politics and caste politics gets you a vote bank and, and that makes sure that you are in power to make sure that there is no communalism in the country, that is often given a justification. At no point of time am I justifying vote bank politics. But I'm telling you why vote bank politics happens. Because if people have a certain set pattern of voting behavior and you are perpetuating that habit so that it gets you to power sooner, then so be it. Then, if the conscience comes under pressure from any basic instincts and becomes dulled, okay, then the human being will descend more and more into an animal-like state and therefore will be forced to exclusively serve your basic instincts. Now you must understand this, your basic instinct is survival, right? You have two wings to fly, but you can only dream to do so if you, are, if you don't have a hungry stomach. So idealism of morals and what is right and wrong only happens when you have life in you, right? That's what this point is about. So for example, during the pandemic, several housing societies in India boycotted doctors from entering their own houses in those housing societies because they believed it was in the best interest because if the doctor was who was attending a COVID patient may themselves have may have infected uh, with COVID, they may spread COVID in the family or in the society. So the society was, was, was being absolutely unreasonable and very, very discriminatory against the very medical professionals who have saved this country from the pandemic to the best of their ability. Similarly, you would often see families and powerful individuals uh, holding on certain key medications during the pandemic, on certain key injections that were very vital uh, as, as reported in the papers during the pandemic. They may not need it, nobody in their family would have needed it at that point. But what if in the future somebody did? And what if in the future somebody did and that is why they're getting rewarded for it? Is of course a very, very important consequence. Similarly, intra-family murders for property. You would have often seen a lot of news items where brother kills brother, sister kills sister, brother kills sister and all the permutations and combinations. That if one of the brothers is doing very well and the other brother is not doing very well, is in fact in a, in a, in a state of acute financial uh, difficulty and the other person is not getting uh, hands on the property, then some criminal actions could be taken. This is also one of the reasons why uh, euthanasia in India is considered to be a very difficult question because of the possible abuse of it because of the possible uh, materialistic ends to it, right? Or for that matter, orchestrating riots. If it's your fundamental basis, then if, if that helps you uh, get to power, or even if you think about it from a world history perspective, that wars were needed so that you would have the industry supplying the armaments of the war to also flourish. So a lot of times this was encouraged. This is of course documented facts. These all essentially explain how basic instincts, uh, your lower basic, most peripheral, most primary instincts are the ones that run. So then what is your conclusion? What is your way forward? Conscience always attains a higher level only when common good is placed above self-interest. The best example I can give you from is environment. It is in the interest of developed countries to have lesser standards of, of reductions in terms of carbon, in terms of emissions. But it is the collective responsibility of the planet to be environmentally safer and environmentally healthier. So for that, if developed countries have to spend more and, 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 and use resources less, so that everybody else can, and we have a balance between sustainability and of course environmentalism, then that is the right way to go. So this is what is called by conscience. This is what is meant by conscience. Okay, good. Now from here, we move to the next part. <coughs> Degree of conscience. 
what is its meaning it means the degree to which we participate in the objective truth namely the absolute good or the absolute right or the absolute just that truth is good but is truth ever absolute there will always be versions of the truth there will always be variations of the truth so are you willing to commit yourself to something which is absolutely true or a version of it right so that is what is called the degree of conscience a best a, a very good example of this is consumerism and materialism we tend to buy things that we don't particularly need and that is why there is a new concept which is being which which is which has gained a fair degree of popularity and that new context is minimalism that you live with the bare possible necessities so that everything you need is what you have and nothing that you need is what you don't have for that you must completely agree that i only need five things in life as long as i have these five things to survive everything else is a non essential so i know these are the five things this is my absolute truth so a completely minimalistic lifestyle so it is the degree to which like for example you have a house to live in you have some mode of transport and you have food to eat those are your basic minimal needs right now in your house do you need what is called fancy teak wood furniture or a sofa cum bed will solve your purpose so you can sit also and sleep also on it that's the difference that is what minimalism is about now what are the factors that influence the degree of conscience the degree of conscience or how close the awareness of the person is to the truth depends unfortunately or fortunately on two factors the assessment of the information and the need of the individual to indulge in their human instincts if this is your ultimate truth right mm -hmm. how do you understand this truth and does it conflict with your basic actions like for example in the whole minimalistic you would want to have a good life you would want to indulge in a little bit of luxury mm -hmm. now this is your basic human instinct and if this is contradicting with your element of of your version of the truth there is going to be a problem for example the assessment of the information received the pandemic impact lives health jobs education understand what this means the pandemic would have impacted the jobs of several thousand people right now several households in our country stopped giving payments to the domestic workers the domestic help in their houses or started giving reduced payments several companies slashed their salaries saying that most of the work is done as work from home so why do we need to pay you more if you're sitting at home while a person sits at home and works actually works more than going to work right for example i've spent a lot of time working from home during the pandemic and i have worked far more in far more number of hours then i would have worked if i was teaching in an offline institute but that does not necessarily mean that this is more uh, attractive second is the need of the individual to indulge in their human instinct now for example there were several reports during the pandemic where people started black marketing oxygen cylinders they started charging several thousand rupees for oxygen cylinders for ambulances which were not even up to the mark and say black marketing or hoarding vaccines your basic human instinct was that i need to make some money however i can during the pandemic right several people called up made a lot of fraudulent calls to people and said okay we have a cylinder why don't you send us the money we'll send you the cylinder back there was no cylinder only the money was received basic human instinct to capitalize on any misery so that depends on you the need of you and therefore what is your conclusion we as the common people are somewhere between these two lines between these two categories and we fight tooth and nail to keep somewhat of a balanced condition and not to shut down our conscience completely that if the companies understand that all right people may be incurring less of an expenditure 
traveling to work, but they would also be consuming more electricity at home. So maybe their salary should be readjusted because they would be using more resources at home, working for the company above and beyond office hours. And therefore, while several people hoarded emergency medication and vaccine in their houses, there were also several people who assisted in COVID mitigation. There were several religious groups, there were several community groups which provided free care, free shelter, free doctors during the pandemic. It all is what you make the most out from your basic elements of conscience. And that is what is meant by a degree of conscience. Then we have something called a crisis of conscience. A crisis of conscience is usually choosing between two rights, choosing between two wrongs, which is less wrong. It is never an issue of between what is right and what is wrong. There will never be a crisis of conscience if it's between right and wrong. A right and wrong will never be a problem because the answer is very simple. Do the right thing. But sometimes what is less wrong or what is more right is your general course of action. So let's understand this. Let's take a few personal examples. A crisis of con conscience is nothing but choosing between two very difficult alternatives because of their impact. So from a personal point of view, let us say a friend who was in, a, who was in an urgent need of money, but you didn't have the money, so you had to steal money from your parents to help your friend who was in a real urgent need. Now, this is a classic case of crisis of conscience because you want to help, but you also know stealing is wrong. But if you're doing it for the right reasons, maybe it is justified. Maybe you'll tell your parents later. Maybe you'll put the money back without the parents noticing. Second is professional. Say, for example, uh, in your annual appraisal or your performance reviews or your your confidential reports. You may exaggerate your contribution at the workplace because everybody does. Everybody will say that we did eight when they actually did four. But because everybody is saying eight, you will also say eight or nine, for instance. And therefore, why would you do so? Because your promotion or your next posting or your growth would depend on it, right? Then there is also something called societal. What is societal? Maintaining a standard of life as as the respect that you earn depends on it. So for example, if we live in a fairly consumer and a materialistic society, uh, sometimes impressions are important. So for example, if let us say you are the collector and you're taking an official meeting, you will have to dress appropriately. You'll have to dress sharply. You'll have to dress uh, in a certain manner. You will have to travel in a specific car in a certain way. Because once you create and establish that kind of authority, your institutions of hierarchy run from it, right? So how you dress and how you carry yourself has a certain impact on it. But is it a wastage of resources? Yes. But it also gains respect for you. It helps you get the job done. So societal. Then governmental. For example, loss-making government companies must be sold to the so must be sold to the private sector. But when you do that, when disinvestment or privatization happens, there's a very good possibility that a lot of people will end up losing jobs, which is always the threat, which has often also been in the news. From a private or from a corporate sector, for example, you are going to project an X amount of profit that you're going to earn so that you can immediately pick up a loan or a funding from the market. Like for example, let us say when a leading uh, fintech company, Paytm, originally went uh, public, uh, show, uh, their shares could be bought ordinarily by people on the stock market, they were priced at a very, very high amount on the assumption that Paytm is going to reap profits in the future. But clearly it did not happen and the share prices have been drastically reducing. There could be several other market factors also for it, but there was definitely a wrongful estimation of what the current state of affairs are, right? From an international perspective, silence upon a nation violating human rights as we depend upon them for natural or national key resources. For example, let us say uh, India-Russia or India-Israel. 
India will remain quiet on a lot of actions taken by these countries which may be perceived globally as objectionable but we will not do that because principles of national interest we need them, we are dependent on them for some of our key resources. Over a course of time we will diversify our dependence, that's what India has been doing but we will never actively go all out against them. So this is nothing but what is called a crisis of conscience. Okay. Now that we understand what is a crisis of conscience, you'll be able to write enough answers on it if there's a question on it, then we can move to morality. Okay. Now, two very important quotes again by Gandhi and by Albert Einstein. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, morality is the basis of things and truth is the substance of all morality. Everything that we should do should be based on principles of morality and morality is nothing but the truth. So everything that we do should be done with the element of truth. Albert Einstein says the most important human endeavor, the most important human endeavor is the striving for morality in our actions. Our inner balance and even our very existence depend on it. Only morality in our actions can give beauty and dignity to life. Which means if morality is not a consideration for what you have done, it will never ever be good enough. It will never give you the kind of benefits or the kind of rewards that you expect from the actions that you have undertaken. Now that we understand this, let's move to related terms and ramifications. So what is morality? Morality basically is nothing but the practice of morals. What is the definition for morality? I have given you a thinker for it, John Day. The standards of right and wise conduct whose authority in practical thought is determined by reason rather than, than custom. Which means whatever is right and whatever is, is, is the wise thing to do, which is the appropriate conduct to follow. And that is decided rationally by some intelligent application of mind and not just because everybody has been doing it for a long time or it is generally accepted. Right? It is nothing but a practice, it's the righteousness of, uh, it's the rightness of wrongness of human action. Now, it nothing, it's nothing but it tells us what we ought to do. It is prescriptive in nature. It gives us a certain set of guidelines that X is right, Y is wrong, Z may or may not be right. So that is your morality. This is more than enough to give you a three to four line introduction. Now, what gives us these principles. How do we decide what is right and wrong? That's what the syllabus is, determinants of morality. The basic is your laws or rules. When the law says X is right and Y is wrong, X is right and Y is wrong. For example, before adultery was decriminalized, adultery was considered to be a criminal offense. Now it is not. When homosexuality was decriminalized, no matter what individually you and I may believe or have an opinion on homosexuality, today if there is a couple who belongs to the same gender and are physically intimate, in their private space there is absolutely no violation of the law. So that's what it is all about. That's what it will always be all about. The law is where morality gets its final structure. And the highest law of the land is the constitution. Now constitutional morality means two things. One, the constitution is a moral document is the assumption. So any law or any action that the government or the country takes should be in conformity to the constitutional values. And the second dimension of constitutional morality is that if the law is absent on a certain issue, then we must follow the general essence of morality in the constitution. If the const if there is if there is if the if the constitution or the laws are silent on X, then we argue if X were to be in the constitution, how would X be regulated? And that is how we would make our further laws on X, whether they require to be put in the constitution or not. For example, Adherence to certain constitutional principles. 
For example, it's a principle that, that there should be checks and balances. It's a principle that certain values of the constitution, the rights especially, cannot be abridged or taken away. So the judiciary came up with the doctrine of basic structure. The decriminalization of, uh, criminalization of homosexuality under 377. It's one of our constitutional principles that gender should not be a reason for discrimination of entry into public spaces. So the Sabri Mala verdict came out where women are equally allowed to enter the temple as much as men are. Similarly, if we talk about life and liberty, life also means a life with dignity and dignity also means a degree of privacy. So therefore, when the courts recognize right to privacy in the Puttaswami judgment as a fundamental right under Article 21, that is adhering to constitutional principles of, of morality. Then we have when the constitution is not very clear, for example, the position of the Lieutenant Governor in Delhi which is why there have been varied court judgments on, on, on varied accounts of time. At the end of the day, Delhi is, has an elected legislature, which means the democratic mandate and the parliamentary integrity of Delhi must be respected. And therefore, the lieutenant governor of Delhi, who is appointed by the centre, even, even if Delhi has restricted powers, for everything that Delhi has powers for, the lieutenant governor must listen to the elected government of Delhi. And that's the moral issue around it, right? Then religion also plays a very important role in determining morality, right? The same example could be, in, uh, could be understood. For example, Sabri Mala, Triple Talaq. Uh, for example, Triple Talaq becomes important because religion gave sanctions to instantaneous Talaq. And that could have been problematic because women were, were mistreated during marriages and of course um, were left uh, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, mosque entry for women, uh, the entry of Parsi women into the fire temple, uh, a specific Bohra community committing, uh, conducting female genital mutilations and those have of course been severely reprimanded by the laws. So religion may allow for certain discrimination but we have to stop it from happening because religion fundamentally said this was okay. It was okay to not allow women to enter a temple. It was okay to conduct an instantaneous talaq. Now there is of course a new movement for a different kind of talaq to also be declared as, as unconstitutional. Culture plays a very strong role in determining what is morality and what is not. For example, your basic differences between patriarchal and matriarchal societies, right? So in a patriarchal society, women may not be given the freedom to wear what they want, work where they want, have a share in property, and therefore, of course, are kept as second citizens within their own home. Third, society, for example, consumerism and materialism is a very, very important aspect of morality. For example, if everybody is in a hunger to acquire the best and the most expensive of goods in the country, in the world at large, you will do whatever it takes to give you the funds to acquire most of those. So consumerism is a problem. Then socialization. Why is socialization a problem? For example, let us say, if a woman is working late, it is considered to be wrong, it is considered to be immoral, it is assumed that the woman has a loose character and so on and so forth. So breaking those kind of stereotypes. Second, men assisting in household chores. So for example, if a man is assisting, assisting in a household activity, it is often assumed that the man is not man enough. Now that seems to be an immoral, that is in fact immoral and therefore that must be changed. But socialization, that women should not work, if they work, they should not work late. Men should not uh, contribute to the, to the activities of the house. And third, of course, is equal recreational opportunities for everybody. Right? For example, if, if men and women want to consume a certain uh, uh, beverage or a certain food item, they should be, whether it's culture, costume, cu cuisine, it's all a matter of socialize, uh, socialization. And that is why morality is never just the law. It's also a lot of other factors. And these factors are the determinants of morality. Okay. Now that we've understand this, we now move to the next part, which is ethics. Now, if morality is the practice of morals, ethics is the science of morals. It is the process and the institutionalization of what is right and what is wrong. So, for example, it is nothing but the theory of right action and the greater good. 
it's a systematic study of the underlying principles of morality that if x is moral y is x moral it's a systematic study of human actions from the point of view of its rightfulness or wrongfulness is it okay for x or for a person to do do something it is not okay for x or a person to do something right so that is something which is called uh, ethics and this study of rightfulness or wrongfulness as a means for attainment of the undi of, of the ultimate happiness or eudaimonia or or pleasure or whatever different moral philosophers call we'll discuss moral philosophers in one go so that it's easy for you to remember and reproduce in the papers but this is what generally ethics means it is nothing but the study of morality the the larger uh, uh, it's 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 institutionalizing morality so to speak so a study of what are good and bad ends to pursue in life and what is right and wrong to do in the conduct of life is also called ethics it is therefore above all a practical discipline it is not just a theoretical discipline it has very practical implications figuring out the determinants of morality and understanding are those determinants relevant or not in the first place its primary most aim is to determine how one ought to live and one and what are the actions one ought to have in the conduct of one's life in the upsc you will never be asked what is the difference between morality and ethics because realistically there isn't a lot of difference ethics is the study of moral principles and several old mod old moral philosophers may look at it differently but in practical sense they are often used interchangeably so you don't have to particularly know a lot of difference i'll give you a table long difference but nothing more than that so ethics is normative it's about what we should be like morality is this is what you are this is what you should be doing these are prescriptive in nature so for example understanding ethical issues with stem cell research genetic mapping genetic cloning changing the basic structure of a person's gene so that we have customized designer babies that's a that's an ethical question you're processing with the natural process of human birth and 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 human individuality the usage of drones it's an ethical issue whether you should be using drones uh, they will have collateral damage of killing innocent civilians but they will also make sure that the target is destroyed without the loss of life of the person launching the drone so that surveillance uh we've discussed its implications on privacy versus national security nuclear armament it is a deterrent but if it used in the wrong way can have an impossibly difficult impact on the world biochemical warfare where other countries may not have the technology and the means for it biochemical warfare is not just harmful and and deadly towards soldiers of the other country or people of the other country it can also have an imp environmental impact um welfare of refugees for example you do not as a country have the resources to feed the people of your own country now you have the obligation to also take care of people who come from another country seeking help in yours it's an ethical question right a uh, diplomacy and national interest it may not be in your national interest it 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 may not be the right thing to do to support a country for something wrong they've done but it is in your national interest to have great relations with them so diplomacy and national interest are of course very ethical applications of morality similarly euthanasia and surrogacy for that matter if a person wants to die they want to die who is the state to regulate it but on the other hand there are enough instances of abuse it may prevent further research into um, chronically uh, terminal diseases there could be issues of implementation there's a human discretion problem similarly there is an issue of surrogacy uh, we understand that there could be commercialization of wombs but at also at the same time it's a person's right to decide whether they want to rent their womb to another person or not who is the government or anybody else to decide so these are all ethical issues on the grounds on the principles of what we believe it is is right to do or not if we believe that somebody a woman should not be renting her womb for commercial purposes so that another family is blessed with the child that is our moral standpoint the study of this moral standpoint is what is often called ethics okay and therefore should be done in the right manner 
you've got multiple formats of ethics this will not be asked in the exam this is nowhere in the syllabus this is too technical but i'll just give you a brief and a very very broad idea normative ethics which tell you what to do are essentially of two kinds teleological and deontological this in a simpler form is nothing but means versus ends and this is important there have been two to three questions that have been asked on means versus ends not on teleological and deontological in those technical words meta ethics is figuring out the philosophy of ethics whether we assume there are some morals we assume there are no morals a sense of absolutism and anti absolutism this does not have to be done so if you are going through any notes if you are going through any books don't do this this is not important this are uh, these are the dimensions of ethics we will be covering them applying ethics in law societal organizational clinical bioethical sexual environmental international and conflict applications so everything from from um, from let us say gene mapping uh, to marital rape uh, to to cloning uh, to to for example uh, biological warfare everything that we could think of very specific issues and dimensions of it i will make you do in one lecture in just a few hours from now and that should take care of the dimensions of it okay so let's spend some time on this teleological theory now teleological theory as we understand this is basically saying that your actions are moral if they lead to moral outcomes right your actions are moral as long as they lead to moral outcomes okay now uh, Je jeremy bentham right who is a very well known moral philosopher in john stuart mill um, who was in fact a student of bentham are are clear proponents of this theory uh, telos in greek means end or purpose what it basically means here is actions are evaluated as moral or immoral depending on whether they help or hinder in the achievement of the chosen end which means if you have to do x to achieve y and y is good then doesn't matter if x is good or not this is called your teleological theory of ethics or ends is more important than the means this end could be happiness or pleasure of any kind well being the general good of people welfare or human kind right uh so for example um a classic experiment was made a, th a theoretical experiment was made it was beautiful experiment I'll, i'll i'll narrate the experiment to you the experiment is for example let us say you are a doctor now uh you have to perform a general surgery on five people 1 2 3 4 5 one person needs a heart the other person needs a uh, a lung the other person needs a liver one person needs kidney one the other person needs kidney two now your neighbor is one single person who has no family no friends no relatives none at all and leads a very very sedate isolated life has nothing no contribution whatsoever is it okay for you to kill this single person harvest all of this person's organs into the five because the end goal is here you are saving five lives here you are saving one and killing one person is wrong to save five or is it wrong to save five this is what is what this is primarily what is called your teleological theory so are the means not important as the ends so for example when the government cancels all ongoing recruitment to streamline and to revolutionize the way junior recruitments in the armed forces are supposed to happen while also trying to solve problems of unemployment and giving treatment and skill to a set of people through the agnipath scheme the means might be a problem one of the things you would have had to do is cancel ongoing recruitments change your entire procedures uh, and not necessarily consult with a lot of stakeholders but the end game is 
to have a better and the end game is to have a more structured recruitment to the armed forces, especially in the lower ranks. Is that okay or not? That's nothing but a Ragnipat scheme. Similarly, we may have not, uh, the government may have not consulted with adequate stakeholders, taken the confidence of political parties, but farm laws individually sought to liberalize and to revolutionize the, the, the concept of agricultural markets. It did not necessarily take them away, but it wanted to give farmers an option of choice. Now, there was miscommunication, there was misunderstanding, the country suffered in protests for almost two years. There were several issues of the citizens' right to protests and the rights to strike and, and consultation. But was it okay for the government to do what it did so that it could try and attempt to revolutionize it? Of course, the government has taken those farm laws back, but this is an application of the theological theory. Similarly, if the government is conducting surveillance to eliminate threats of national security, because at the end of the day, if the nation is secure and a few people have a problem with it in terms of, 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 of surveillance being breached, that's okay. Similarly, in Afghanistan, when US and NATO were present, they were trying to eliminate, uh, eliminate uh, sort of terror, but they also caused a lot of damage. They caused a lot of ramifications so that the end goal was peaceful Afghanistan was that justified? Of course, today you've got the Taliban now, and that therefore do the ends justify the do the means justify the ends. Similarly, uh, we want to create a safer society, and for creating a safer society, we have to create a deterrence or a fear of the law. And one of the best ways to create a fear of the law is through death penalty. So, should we have the institutions? of death penalty so that there is a fear and a deterrence of some law of some kind is again means versus ends. Then we also have criminalizing drug use to strive for an adultery uh, from, from an addiction free society. Consumption of drugs or consumption of recreational drugs could be an individual choice but that could also mean that drugs can destroy societies, communities and nations. South America is a classic example of it. So if India has very, very strict consumption of drugs laws, does that help us the ends of being a drug-free society or, or helps us to be a de-addicted society? Similarly, higher taxes and advertisement restrictions on tobacco products. We understand that we are heavily taxing tobacco products and heavily uh, restricting advertisements of it because we don't want people to consume them and therefore uh, is this economic policy justified towards the larger goal of having a tobacco free India this is a teleological theory so you can give several such examples 150 words would be more than enough always remember never just explain the example never just quote the example explain how the example relates to the theory this is very, very important. It is extremely crucial and cannot be taken away. Cannot be taken away under all circumstances. Okay? So that is that. Now, from here, let's move to the next, the deontological theory. Where the means are more important than the ends, there is, of course, uh, Dion, which is a Greek word for duty. Uh, Immanuel Kant has been a great proponent of this theory. Now the deontological theory says the morality of an action is determined by some form of authority independent of the consequences that such actions generate. It doesn't matter if it is for the ultimate good or bad. If the action is independently bad, it is bad. It doesn't matter why that action was undertaken. Some classic examples of this, this is very common. This has been asked two, three times before, which is why you should do it in a limited amount of scope. First, for example, Israel-Palestine conflict. It might be for the ultimate achievement of homeland and, and protecting the religious belief of a certain set of people. But violence is not justified under any circumstances that fundamentally makes any action taken by either of the two sides as wrong in perpetuating violence. Similarly, uh, 
Twitter's restricting certain access of certain people, shutting down certain accounts. Or for example, the government requesting through their uh, originator rules in the new IT rules saying that if there is a communal riot and we believe that there is an origin information problem, we need all the details where the, the message was sent for the first time and Twitter originally not complying with this, is that disclosing user information is fundamentally wrong no matter what the consequences. That is why Twitter had originally objected to it. But this could also be theological in the sense that the larger aim is to prevent communal rights from spreading. Third, FCRA regulatory changes that when you say that NGOs should only have an account in Delhi if they are to take funds from foreign agencies or they cannot spend more than X amount of funds on administrative expenses, that is restricting the way an NGO works and that is fundamentally wrong. You are forcing them to to set up organizational units or finance units when there is no need to be. Superstitions such as marrying a tree to wither omen away, now this is from a sociological point of view. Doesn't matter this is to prevent the health of your partner from deteriorating or you know it helps you uh, give in to customs and make people happy. By the sheer act of marrying a tree you are demeaning the institution of marriage in the first place then severely punishing or beating a child at school or at home. You may want to make the child disciplined, you would want to make the child better, more productive, but beating a child is wrong. There are no two doubts about it. So that's the deontological school of thought. That will always be the deontological school of thought. Okay. Now, from here, we move to the next part, which is the sources of ethics. This is very simple. So sources of ethics are very, very clear, very, you can just give uh, ramification examples of this. Family, friends and colleagues, religion, education, workplace, judiciary, media, you could add technology also for that matter. And you have to give very clear examples. So family, for example, if you see elders cutting a line, you will never be in a queue. If you see elders in the house shouting at people on the, st on the road or driving on the wrong side of the road or throwing garbage on the road, the child will always pick that up as a habit. If you see elders uh, you know, shouting or misbehaving with their elders, you will misbehave with your elders. Uh, basic manners, etiquette, the way women are treated in a household is how you will treat women when you grow up. If you don't see respect for personal hygiene, if you don't see uh, basic hygiene attributes in the house, uh, you will not be hygienic and therefore be unhealthy later on. Similarly, friends and colleagues, aversion to vices, discipline, ambition and goals. So for example, if your friends are drug addicts, you will definitely try and, and become one. That is why most people pick up smoking, uh, which is not only a, a dangerous habit, but also uh, is a mental health addiction problem and I know the contradiction and I know the uh, the conflict when I say this but I know this is a problem anyways but the the idea behind here is that most people pick up a smoking habit from peers similarly if you are it is always said that you are the sum your IQ is the sum of the five people that you hang out with so if you're pe if you're with people who are negative if you're with if your friends are, are not productive enough, if your friends are not uh, are driven enough, if your friends are unethical, you would tend to be okay with things which are not right. Similarly goes for ambition and goals. Uh, religion, we've discussed this in terms of um, triple talaq, in terms of how relationships are run, in terms of cuisine and costume. For example, if uh, burqa or, or hijab or for that matter consumption of meat or for that matter um, f uh, you know, uh, preference for a male child, all of these somewhere come from institutions of religion and of course uh, matrimony. Education institutions play a very, very strong role. If you haven't been taught to thought, uh, to think critically, to question status quo, if your educational institutions are okay with you copying somebody's homework, therefore you will not have respect for intellectual integrity, you will essentially be okay with plagiarism. If institutions allow you to fake case studies, to allow you to fake projects and simulations, you will also end up doing that later on in your career because you never got caught. Similarly, workplace. 
uh, the kind of offices, the kind of, of, of work cultures that you have. So for example, if the work culture is toxic, you will become toxic when you come home. You will become uh, very pragmatic, you will become very, very political, you will become very obnoxious as a person because the work has an impact on you. Work has an aggression on you, which is why it is very important for police personnel to also have a life outside work because they deal with the worst in society and that definitely has an impact on them. It does make them tougher and more difficult people. Similarly, judiciary. When the judiciary says homosexuality is okay, transgender rights must be protected, privacy is above all, euthanasia must be regulated to the concept of a living will, you also elevate the moral standards of a person, right? And the media plays a very, very strong role, right? If you, if you don't have, a, have an accurate, unbiased and adequately covered media, then you will only be see, uh, shown what the media wants you to see. You will only see one side of the farmers' protests. You will see one side of the Maharashtra issue, the religious communal protests, uh, the media trials, and therefore you will not have what is called an informed view. And that therefore becomes very, very difficult and very, very problematic to begin with, right? So the source of ethics. Now, after the source of ethics, we could move on to further understanding the importance or the consequences of ethics. Why is this important? This is very simple, this is very basic, you don't have to worry too much about it. Just write this as it is. Human need, being fair, honest and ethical is a need for many people. Credibility, any organization which is ethical will always be credible and credibility is your ultimate currency. Any organization which is driven by good values, good leadership will always be revered. For example, Tata's is always given so much credibility in the market. Improved decision making, when you know that your decisions are going to ultimately be moral and ethical, sooner or later, shorter or longer run, they will always be better decisions. Long term gains. Companies which are ethical will always be more profitable in the longer run. Unethical companies may reach their, 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 uh, their goals in, in a very short uh, phase, in a very short manner, but they will never be able to sustain their top position. It also helps you safeguard society. Often ethics succeeds in law. Often remember ethics succeeds law in safeguarding society. For example, if technology is growing at a faster pace, by the law, by the time the law comes to, to by the time we develop a better law uh, to, to morally regulate uh, um, society or to morally regulate technology, it is essentially the ethics which is going to stop us from using technology in a bad way. For example, the IT Act came in the year 2000s, right? Technology has been there a little before that. Till today, IT Act is not taking care of a lot of elements and applications of technology. So for example, cyber bullying is wrong. Cyber stalking is wrong. Uh, dark net and, and face morphing somebody over the internet is wrong. The law will take its own course, but it should be an ethical standard to not cyber stalk or cyber bully somebody. Self-realization, helping a person to critically evaluate their choices. And lastly, politics. Good politics and great politics always require trust and commitment and that can only happen if your ethics are high. And therefore ethics are the essential of what is called a good political system in the world generally as a whole. Right? So this is why it is important, this is why it should be done in the larger context. Now, how do you know whether an action was ethical or not? Just again, very quickly, you don't have to read too much into this. This is more than enough. Okay. One, <clears throat> free will. If a person has multiple choices and you have the freedom to pick one within those choices, only then can we debate whether it's ethical or not. The same way you can't force somebody to, to do something wrong, you can't also force somebody to do something right. What is right and what is wrong should always come from an element of choice and, and that element of choice must be celebrated. Second, knowledge. Unless and until we, we, we will never be able to exercise free will in an ethical manner unless we know the consequences of it. If we have to make a decision X and we don't know whether the consequences are going to be A or B which is good or bad, 
this decision in itself becomes a, a compromise, which is why in the law we often say, non-knowledge of a law is a problem, but ignorance of the law is not a problem. If you don't know that the law existed, there is a problem. But if you did not know, uh, if you were, if you were, if you were ignorant of the law, that is an issue. Fear. If somebody tries to kill you and you kill you, kill them back in self-defense, then you're acting away from the natural course of your life. You're acting under the fear of your life. So while it is subject to legal scrutiny, there would be a case against you. But from an ethical standpoint, it may or may not necessarily be true. Then pathological status. See, a husband, for example, suffering from schizophrenia, mistreats his wife. This is not subject this is not subject to ethical scrutiny because remember I told you you have to be in a healthy state of affairs because the person is in a mental disorder does not understand the knowledge does not have the the reasons to believe why a person is doing it right or wrong and the same way uh, when like for example a mentally unstable person uh, falls into a tiger enclosure and this was in the news last year uh, this is this is not ethical because the person is mentally unstable then it is also a question of habit. For example, uh, Japanese children are often trained to apologize profusely, even for the slightest mistake that they do. They're a very, very hospitable clan, right? Any form of discomfort, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a world of its own. But if an American who's working in, in Japan doesn't understand the basic social customs, you can't term the American as unethical because you don't understand what the social customs are because it's not in your American way of life. Similarly, you've got a value system. Now, this is important. Uh, say, theoretically, historically, a fallen samurai would prefer to commit ritualistic suicide than to suffer torture by surrendering. Now, this is a part of this person's Bushido honor, as, as, as they'd like to call it. Now, if a fallen American soldier doesn't commit suicide, it can't be on ethical grounds because it's the value system. So if, if, if an American soldier of any other uh, army soldier decides to, to surrender, that does not mean the person does not have a value. Your value systems may change depending on the circumstances that you may may be or may not be in. So this is your evaluation of an action, okay? Now that we understand the basics of it, let's look at a quick comparison of things. See, now comes the understanding of it. Ethics are primarily external rules. They may vary between environments. Morals, on the other hand, are personal principles and they rarely change. And where both of them intersect is where you have right and wrong conduct. Which is why it is very, very rare for you to be asked the differences between the two because they are fairly, fairly correlated as concepts in this ecosystem. So let's quickly understand some basic differences with certain examples. Ethics and morals. See, we've discussed ethics are rules of conduct which are recognized in, part, in a particular class or, or, or a particular culture. Uh, these are morals are basically principles with respect to right and wrong. They describe do's and don'ts. It's basically a personal compass. So where do they come from? Ethics is a social system. It's external. Morality is very individualistic. It's very personal. Why are we ethical? Because society tells us, communities tell us, the ecosystem tells us it's the right thing to do. Morals, because we believe that something is right and wrong, doesn't matter what the society may believe so. Ethics are, are specifically dependent on others for definition, depending on the society that you're in. And therefore, they're consistent in that context. Societies for a very long time will have a certain set of ethical standards. However, when we look at morality, they are usually consistent. But if a person's belief changes, if a person's individual moral compass changes, something happens because of which the person ultimately changes their, their way of life, then that is how morality would change. For example, it will take very long for societies in India to be comfortable with homosexuality. But if a person has enough friends who are homosexuals, would understand this is very normal to, to like somebody of the same gender, love is love, doesn't matter who the person is. And therefore, that would be a faster change. Now, what is the gray area? The gray area is a person strictly following ethical principles may not necessarily have any morals because you're conforming to an institutionalized structure. 
Likewise, a person could violate ethical principles within a given system of rules to maintain moral integrity. That, for example, a friend of yours is, is celebrating a union with his partner who's also of the same gender. Now, you would want to go stand with the person. Your parents would forbid you from doing so. That's a conflict of ethics and morality, right? A moral person is always bound by a higher covenant, may choose to follow a code of ethics and would, would apply it to suit their own. So therefore, ethics is, is far more structured and far more uniform, whereas morals are slightly more subjective. E ethos is the origin to the word ethics and mos is the origin to the word customs, which is often considered to be similar from a philosophical point of view. And ethics are usually governed by professional or legal guidelines or some social covenant or some social diktat, whereas morality goes above and beyond culture. It is a very, very personal ecosystem. So you can add the examples that I've already given you and make answers and comparisons. You will not usually get a 10 marker on it. So you just need to know two or three points and that is more than enough. Next is ethics and values. See. Ethics are a set of morals that define the morality of a person. Values are, st are, are standards and principles that determine priority. This is what is important for me and this is what I'd like to achieve. Personal versus professional. Ethics are usually professional in nature. Values are personal. Like for example, code of ethics, code of conduct or societal ethics. There's institutionalization here. Values are personal in the sense that it is your personal value, you're ambitious as a person, that is a value, right? But you have integrity, Is that is what is called your ethical compass. Now, how does ethics impact? You'll see professions, organizations, institutions, governance, uh, government for that matter. Values are usually family values, cultural values, community-driven values. That is what they get influenced by and that is what they influence. Ethics vary from profession to profession, society to society, community to community. But values could also be what are called individualistic in nature, which is why your UPSC syllabus also says human values. It never says organizational values. So organizational values could be understood as a collective human value, but that's okay. Ethics determine what is right and wrong. Values determine a sense of priority, urgency, and importance. Consistency, ethics are always uniform, values like morality can differ from person to person. Ethics prevent you from doing something wrong. Values are aspirational and achievable in nature, they, they promote you to do something right. Now what are ethics? Ethics is nothing but a system of moral principles, whereas values is nothing but a stimuli for thinking. This tells you this is how it is, like it or not, take it or leave it. Whereas values tell you, okay, this is where I have to reach. So this is what I have to do to reach there, right? So that is how it works. So for example, honesty, integrity, punctuality, and loyalty are ethical principles, right? Whereas likes, dislikes, perspectives, prejudices, judgments are value systems that you like something, you don't like something and so on and so forth, right? They overlap a little bit and therefore you have human values for civil services where integrity, honesty also becomes a value ecosystem. Why? Because while you are supposed to be honest, you're also expected to be honest as a civil servant. So honesty becomes a civil service value as well. So that is the basic difference. Then you have uh, law and morality. Law are nothing but sanctions invariably imposed for the infringement of a legal obligation. Whereas uh, morality, there is no official sanction for immoral, immoral behavior. Although society often creates its own form of censorship, it's individualistic in nature. Law is deliberately changed by the parliament or the courts over a period of time. Morality cannot be deliberately changed. It's a slower process. It, is, it takes a lot more transition of a time. Legal principles always have a certain degree of certainty and structure to it, whereas morality is invariably much, much more flexible and variable. And what is legal may not necessarily be moral and what is moral may not necessarily be legal. So, for example, let us say, um, of course, you have adultery, abortion and all of those uh, uh, prostitution and, and drugs as your standard arguments. But if you look at it in, in, in one form, let us say in a neighborhood, uh, this is house one, house two, house three, house four. 
a person of house one killed their entire family. Now, it is moral enough for all of these to come and try and kill or beat up this person as house one. But this is definitely not legal, right? Similarly, let us say, for example, it's an empty road, but it's a one-way road. There's nobody here, but you decide to drive a car this way. Morally, it is okay, but, illegal, but it is illegal because you're violating a traffic law by going in the opposite direction, right? And that is why it is very, very subjective. Now, you must also understand, uh, for example, the same case with the same facts can go to judge one and judge two, and they can have two different judgments on it. One judge may give you a compensation of 5 lakhs, the other might give you a compensation for 10 lakhs. So everything at the end of the day will always have a subjective component to it, a subjective phenomena to this, right? Uh, there has been a question on law and ethics and law and morality. I don't see this to be repeated again, which is why I'm just giving you a broad difference so that you don't have to spend too much time in it. Just this much is actually more than enough. And again, law and ethics is something that you should know. A broad understanding. Uh, law, again, is a set of rules and regulations. Ethics, on the other hand, are a set of morals and principles. Uh, laws are individuals, are, are, are essentially, uh, individuals are, are required to obey them. In ethics, uh, you have to conform to them. There is no legal enforcement as such. Law is governed by the government. Ethics is usually individual, legal, or professional norms. They may or may not be implemented. They may or may not be enforced. Law always leads to punishment, always leads to penalties, whereas ethics does not. I have put this in the first slide also when I was comparing all of them. Uh, law always is in a written form. Ethics sometimes may be written, may often, more often than not, may not be written, may not be enforceable. Lawyers, legislatures, uh, executive, these are the guys who make the laws. Religious leaders, philosophers, elders, society, community leaders are the ones who make ethics or say leadership within an organization. Laws apply to a country, a state, to a specific place of crime. Ethics are not particularly jurisdictional in nature. The objective of law is to maintain social order, whereas the objective of ethics is to help people choose what is right and wrong. Law is always binding. Ethics may or may not be binding. The characteristics is it is enforced. It needs to be published. It is consistent. It always needs to be obeyed, whereas ethics don't have to be enforced, don't have to be published. They may or may not be consistent, and it is not, it is not necessary to obey them. Right? We've done several examples already. I've put them in a database. I link it in the description box below. You will not need anything else beyond this. Now, lastly, code of ethics and code of conduct. The basic difference is a code of ethics is a document issued by a top level management or a senior government organization on core guidelines. Like, for example, uh, every company will have a value system, a mission document, right? Uh, that's the code of ethics. Whereas a code of conduct is a document which very specifically has to be followed within the government, within a profession, and so on and so forth. For example, um, NHRC had once released a code of ethics for companies. Uh, the CAG released a code of ethics for the, for the audit and accounts department. There are several codes of ethics. For example, the National Medical Commission would have a code of ethics for doctors. The Bar Council would have a code of ethics for lawyers. They are broad principles that you have to follow. They're not enforceable per se. But a code of conduct, for example, the civil services conduct rules, they cannot be violated. They have to be followed. There would be a punishment if you don't. These are generally in nature that, for example, uh, the companies have to balance uh, employee welfare and sustainability. These are very general. They're, they're, they're like directive principles. They're like the preamble. Whereas the code of conduct is very specific. A civil servant cannot take any gift in cash or kind from anyone. And therefore, the code of ethics is very wide, whereas the code of conduct is spe specifically very, very narrow. And code of ethics, therefore, helps you make better decisions. This regulates the actions that you are taking to implement those decisions. That's why code of ethics is usually very short, two pages, three pages maximum. 
but a code of conduct is very technical it covers every specific possibility and code of ethics is always publicly available whereas the code of conduct is only for the employees in the case of the government civil servants their public servants so it's available for the public as well and therefore code of ethics largely focuses on values and principles whereas code of conduct is about some compliance some rules that have to be followed under all circumstances so this is code of ethics and code of conduct right this is it nothing beyond this will be asked from this in the mains exam even if it's an application based question you have enough examples to apply them in your answers thank you and be out with the second lecture in a few hours bye bye